1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to break right smack into the middle of a, a discourse that Paul is giving to the church at Corinth. And if you're not familiar with the church at Corinth, we do understand the word dysfunctional. Right? That was the church at Corinth. 16 chapters in the book of 1 Corinthians, and every chapter is a rebuke. They had so many things wrong, he actually wrote a second letter that we don't have before we have in our Bible 2 Corinthians. The second letter to the church at Corinth is lost, but we have the third letter, which we call 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians has a whole different demeanor and attitude to it. But 1 Corinthians is just flatly a rebuke. The whole thing from beginning to end. So he, he has chapter 15 in here, and all of chapter 15 is about the resurrection. Now you would think, if there's one thing that's going to be a fundamental, undisputed truth, it would be that Jesus rose from the dead. But Paul talks about how is it that some of you believe and teach that there's no resurrection of the dead. And so chapter 15 is to correct the heresy that Jesus did not rise from the dead. There's a lot of, of popular thinking in world religions today that Jesus did not rise from the dead. Uh, Gnostic books are, are being promoted today that talk about Jesus not uh, being dead on the cross, but actually uh, going off and marrying Mary Magdalene and having children by her, that is nonsense and a tool of the enemy. Jesus Christ died a vicarious or atoning sacrifice for us, a substitutionary sacrifice for us, died that on the cross, was placed in the grave, and rose bodily on the third day. The grave was open not so he could get out, but so that we could look in. And so what we want to look at today is, what if the resurrection didn't happen? And Paul talks about that in chapter 15. And from the beginning, he establishes, yeah, there is a resurrection. Jesus Christ was really seen after his resurrection. And in the first part, he says he's seen by 500 in addition to the 12. And last of all, Paul says he was seen by me as one born out of due time. Because the qualification for being an apostle was you have to have, had to have seen personally Jesus. Beginning at verse 12, if you don't have your Bible, that's fine. Just listen along. Chapter 15, verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testify that God, about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it's true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope, in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, and by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first, first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to him. Then the end comes when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Well, in spite of the ongoing onslaught against the reality of Jesus Christ's uh, death, burial, and resurrection from the dead, uh, the scriptures maintain truth. They transcend time, and they are reliable. And so, but Paul does us a good favor 
by listing for us some of the negative ramifications of not of Christ not rising from the dead. Disbelieving the resurrection of Christ has dire consequences. If, if we say or if we buy into Jesus didn't rise from the dead, there are some dire consequences of that. And I'll, I've got six listed for you. Number one, Paul lists these, and I'm just going to reiterate them to you. The preaching of the gospel would be mere empty words. It's just babbling, vain babbling, and, 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 and exercise in futility, and we might as well just preach, you know, how to get rich and how to have good philosophy. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. So from a pastor's perspective, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, why take the time to preach the gospel built on deception? My question to the liberals is, if you don't believe the Bible is true, what in the world are you doing? What is the point? Why, why try and present a Jesus you don't even believe in? I met with a group of pastors as a young pastor. They met in a hospital. Many of you heard the story. But there, it was this uh, clergy meeting, meeting at a hospital, and the question was, or the topic was, the authority of Scripture. I assumed in my naivety that they were going to help me, as a young pastor, know how to use the Word of God in ministering to others. The hospital was only a meeting place. Out of 20 pastors, I was the only one who believed that the Bible is the Word of God. But one, one pastor said, it doesn't matter to me if Jesus rose from the dead or not then why are you doing what you're doing? Another pastor said, it doesn't matter to me if Jesus was born of a virgin or not. Why are you doing what you're doing? If you don't believe that the Bible is the word of God, what's the point? And I suppose the point would be, it might pay well. Other than that, I don't see a point to it. The preaching of the gospel is for the purpose of transforming lives. And if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, what's to be transformed into? So if Christ hasn't been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Why would anyone want to preach about Jesus if he's still in the tomb? That, that's, that's the point of all of Paul, what Paul's saying. Why even go through this thing of preaching the gospel because the word gospel means good news. What's the point if there's no good news? It's just news. Kind of like we got today, skewed and biased. But not good news. The second thing, your faith that led to salvation would be empty and futile. Uh, we, we talk about conversion by faith. We talk about having faith in Jesus. We talk about believing in God and having transformed lives. And this faith that leads to salvation would be just empty and futile. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14, if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is in vain. It's empty. It's pointless. You're a fool. If you, so we might say, if you place your faith in a Savior who's still in the grasp of death, what's the point? What's the point? If, you know, a lot of people say, well, Jesus was just a good teacher. Some religions say he was a prophet. Now understand, Jesus said he would rise from the dead. If he didn't, he's A, not good, and B, not a prophet. He's crazy. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. But because he did rise from the dead, he validates the, everything he said prior to his death, that he would rise from the dead. And if all you have is faith in a mythical resurrection without the reality of it, what's the point? What's the point? If Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, then let's this, this just stop the sham and call it what it is. But the reality is Jesus did rise. That's why we're here. And Paul really wants the Corinthian church to get it. 
Just stop believing every wind of doctrine that comes on and stick with what does the Bible say. And if the Bible's not being taught, get out of the church and go somewhere else where it is. Number three, the testimony of the apostles would be in, a, in question. Uh, the word apostle means sent one. And so we've got these apostles, except for Judas, who was a false apostle. Uh, we've got the, the apostles who were with Jesus for three, three and a half years, listened to him teach, uh, cast out, they cast out demons themselves. He gave them ministry. They went out on a couple of different occasions, and, and they even says on one report back, we even saw Satan fall from heaven. That's power. But if it's not true that Jesus rose from the dead, they're just a bunch of liars. Verse 15, we, and Paul includes himself as an apostle because he saw Jesus after Jesus' resurrection, We're even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it's true that the dead are not raised. So we can't, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, if the dead aren't raised, then the apostles are a bunch of fakes and a bunch of liars. They're misrepresenting God. So if the testimony of the apostles is a lie, again, we ask the same thing. What's the point? What's the point? If those who say they're eyewitnesses are in fact liars, then what in the Bible can be trusted? Because much of the Old Testament points to Jesus. In fact, we could say that all of the Old Testament points to Jesus. And if Jesus isn't who he says he is and doesn't do what he said he's going to do, what can we trust? And so we have to have a faith in a Jesus who rose from the dead. Otherwise, it's just a sham. Number four, the sacrifice of Christ would be of no effect. He would, he would have been a fool to die on the cross. Verse 17, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Jesus died for one purpose and one purpose only according to the scriptures. It's got manifold uh, sections to it, but he died to satisfy the Father's just demand that sin be punished. And the Father on that day poured out his wrath on the Son, punished him for our sins, the just for the unjust, so that we could have eternal life. That's it. And if Jesus Christ atoned for our sin, then there's no other atonement that needs to be made. And if Jesus didn't atone for our sin, then nothing can do it because he was perfect. And if a perfect man, the Son of God, God with flesh, as we know it in the Scriptures, can't atone for sin and doesn't rise from the dead, we are stuck in our sin. We're, we're, in, we're in trouble. There's nothing we can do. So we could say it this way, if Christ did not rise from the dead, what's the point in sins being forgiven? All this talk about your sins being forgiven through the blood of Jesus is just nonsense if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. And if there's no life after death, then what's the point in our sins being forgiven? Why have your sins forgiven if there's nothing beyond this life? Number five. Christians who died would remain in the grasp of death. Christians who died would remain in the grasp of death. Verse 18, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If Christ is not raised from the dead, then nobody has eternal life. And the atheist is right. There's nothing beyond this life. We're just dogs that die, get put in the ground, and that we are, we are reduced to fertilizer. That's not the gospel message. And number six. 
if all of life, or, or if Jesus didn't die, all, arise from the dead, all of life would redu be reduced to hopelessness. It'd be hopeless. And by the way, we live in a hopeless world. Why? Because God is being removed from every facet of society. And it does not lead to more hope. It leads to hopelessness. And our world needs hope, and people need hope, and they need to be told about a Savior who didn't stay dead. They need to be told about a Savior who rose from the dead to forgive sins and give people a brand new life. If Christ didn't, well, verse 19, if, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we're of all people most to be pitied. If, we could say it this way, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, then all this talk about sacrificial living, about denying yourself and taking up your cross and follow, what's the point? If you've got your Bibles, here's an interesting verse that Paul says. Verse 32, he's talking about sacrificial living and and, and because of Jesus Christ's resurrection, he preaches the gospel, and he's willing to suffer for it. And verses 32, and uh, verse 32, he says, "What do I gain, human is speaking? I fought with beasts in Ephesus. If the dead are not rise, let's just eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. What's the point?" If Jesus isn't alive today, what's the point? If Christ didn't rise from the dead, then Christians really do live pathetic and wasted lives. Now, I'm glad this is all Paul setting this up, right? Because how, how hopeless is all of this? One commentator said, Paul is not talking about human mortality in general, but the hopelessness of Christians in the face of death. In other words, in this time, Nero's come into power and already is in power, and we know from history that Nero was not kind to Christians, and he used to wrap them in tar paper and burn them alive to light his porch. What's the point in being a Christian if that's all you've got to look forward to? What's the point in dying a martyr's death for Jesus? What's the point in going around the world to share Christ with people? What's the point in sacrificial living if Jesus didn't rise from the dead and there's nothing beyond this life? What's the point? And following the verses I just read, Paul makes a very, very important statement. Verse 33, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. If you hang around people with bad doctrine, it's going to rub off, and your doctrine will be negatively affected, and you're going to begin to believe heresy. That's why being with people who teach the truth is so important. That's why being in churches that teach the truth is so important, because Bad doctrine twists our thinking. Well, let's move on to the good news. I like good news better. But Paul, again, 16 chapters in 1 Corinthians, and everyone's a rebuke. They were messed up, so we have to be very careful about building our doctrine on the book of 1 Corinthians because we dare not take a rebuke and make it into a doctrine when Paul's trying to correct some things. We have to be very careful about what the church was practicing so that we don't just assimilate Corinthian habits. We have to take good doctrine. So number one, let's get some, some, some good doctrine. Jesus is the first of many who will rise to eternal life. Jesus isn't the only one who rose from the dead or will rise from the dead. He's the first of many. Verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. 
He has risen from the dead. He is the first fruits. First fruits takes us back to Old Testament time when the Jewish community was told when they harvest their crop in the fall, the very first portion of that harvest, the first fruits of the harvest, was given back to the Lord. That's why tithing is important. Giving the first fruits of your offering back to the Lord. We also find that in the the dedication of the firstborn in the Old Testament. The first fruits was always a promise of more. And so that's that is what the definition of first fruits means. First fruits literally means the first of a harvest with the promise of more to come. The first of a of a harvest with the promise of more to come. Jesus Christ is called the first fruits. He's not called the only one. He's the first of many who would rise from the dead, but we won't do it in the same way he did it. When he stood before Pilate, Pilate said to him, hey, don't you realize I have the power to give you life and I have the power to take it away? Jesus looks at him right before his death. Jesus is very confident. He says, you would have no power at all if it weren't for my Father in heaven who would give you that power. Every bit of power you have was given to you. And Jesus said, Nobody takes my life from me. I have the power to lay it down. And I have the power to raise it up. See, Jesus rose by his own power. We will rise because of his power. I have yet to perform a funeral. By the way, I want you to know that this was the first time I've worn a tie, either since Andrew and Caitlin's wedding or my last funeral that I've done. So to be honored today, I wore a tie. I tied it without a mirror. I still know how. But why, why, why go through all of this? The reality is that we celebrate a risen Savior not just because he rose from the dead, but because by faith in Jesus Christ, we also will rise from the dead. There's hope in that. The world needs the hope of the gospel. Christianity is not a hopeless religion, though many try to make it that way. James chapter 1, verse 18. Of his own will, speaking of God, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creation. As that word first fruits again, and what James is saying is James, the half brother of Jesus, is writing the book of James and saying, here's the truth you need to remember. Remember, And he's talking to people 2,000 years ago. There's more of us to come. We're not the only Christians, and we're not the only ones who will be Christians in the world. There's more of us. We're just the first of many. The will of God is that he will redeem people to be his own children, and we're just the first of many. That's the cool thing about being a Christian, that that we're not alone. Remember Elijah back in the uh, first Kings. Elijah was uh, was confronting this wicked king Ahab, and after he had defeated the 400 uh, prophets of Baal and the 450 prophets of the Asherah poles that Jezebel, Ahab's wife, set up, um, he gets discouraged when she puts out a death threat on him. Literally, she, she... promises a reward for anybody who kills him. And, and Elijah, he's, he's all worn down because of the spiritual battle, and it's just, Lord, I'm the only one who hasn't bowed the knee to Baal. Basically, what God told him was, just mind your own business. Just to encourage you, I got 7,000 in Israel who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. Now, we think 7,000, that's a lot. Out of how many millions... Right? 7,000 spread throughout the United States, all that worship Jesus. How, how, how uh, comforting would that feel? You're not the only one. There's more, and there's more to come. That's the cool part of being a Christian. We're not in this thing alone. That's why the church is so important, because we feel like we've got to our jobs, and we're all alone, or maybe we're the only Christian on the job. We feel like, I'm all alone. We come together on Sunday, and we're going, hey, I'm not alone. This is cool. I'm not alone. 
Jesus' resurrection is the promise of resurrection for all who would be raised from the dead. It's the first fruit. Second, Jesus secured the resurrection for many. Now, we're making a distinction here. He's not talking about the, the resurrection of the wicked to eternal destruction. He's only talking about, in this context, the resurrection of Christians to eternal life. So Jesus secured the resurrection for many. Verse 21, For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. When Adam was in the Garden of Eden, God put him in the garden. He said, look at this. This is all available to you. The whole garden, there's not anything that you can't have except this one tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Doesn't matter what kind of fruit it had on it. It's irrelevant. Could have been an apple. Could have been a banana. Could have been something we know nothing about. Doesn't matter what kind of tree it is. God just said, look, I'm claiming that tree. That's my tree. Nothing special about the tree, but God called it the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Not because in the tree was anything inherent, but because God said, that's my tree. You can touch any other tree. It's all free for you to eat. And the only tree that attracted them was the one off limits. It's kind of like a kid. We got 200 chairs in here. But let's just say I tell one of our children, children, not my, my children would never do this, but I would tell one of our children, that's my chair, don't touch it. Here's what they do. They look at that chair. There's 199 other chairs. All of a sudden, that chair is the focus of attention. And they walk by it. Right? They could walk by 199 other chairs. And they're going to go over here a little closer to it. Why that chair? There's nothing special about that chair other than, that's my chair. Then they're going to go like this. Right? They're just going to touch the chair as they walk by. Why? That's my chair. I said it's off limits. Is it really your chair? Are you big enough to keep your word? And then you get Satan thrown in the mix who speaks to them and lies to them, deceives them. And death came to all man because Adam sinned. Not because Eve sinned. Eve did sin. And she sinned first. Adam should have stopped her. Adam, as a spiritual leader, had the responsibility to help his wife not sin. And not only did he not help her, he saw she didn't die, because they didn't know what death was. Apparently, he thought she was expendable. Because God told him, if you eat it, you're going to die. Eve doesn't believe the very words of God, so she has to add in, and if you touch it. But because she sinned, mankind didn't fall because Eve was not our federal head. Eve was not our national representative. Adam was. Adam saw she didn't die. She gave him the fruit, and instead of throwing it away and rebuking her, he ate it. And at the moment of his rebellion, their eyes were open. They realized they were naked, and they hid themselves from God. That's what sin does. And death came upon all men because of Adam's sin. One man sinned, and it's transferred to all people. But Jesus Christ overcame death. And that life, that promise of resurrection is given to all who by faith receive him into their hearts and lives. Jesus became a man in order to set right the consequences of sin, of the sins of the first man, which is death. Jesus undid what Adam did. Every time we talk about or see Adam in the New Testament, Adam always stands as the one 
who did sin and the one through whom sin came. Every time we see Jesus in the New Testament, whether he's referred to as the son or the second Adam, we see him as the life-giving Adam. The first Adam was the death-giving Adam. The second Adam is the life-giving Adam. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sin. That, that's where we are in Adam. We are walking dead people outside of Jesus Christ. But Romans 5.15, just a couple verses beyond, Paul writes these words, But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift of the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Jesus did what Adam failed to do. Adam failed to give life. Instead, he gave death. Jesus Christ took our death and gave life. The righteous dying in the place of the unrighteous. That's why it's not by works of righteousness which were redeemed, but through the blood of Jesus Christ. The sacrifice of Christ purchased for us what Adam couldn't do. It secured our salvation. Number three. Jesus gives life beyond death to all who have faith in him. Jesus gives life beyond death to all who have faith in him. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 and 23. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Again, he's talking to Christians, not about the, the resurrection of the dead who are going to hell, but Christians. But each in its order, Christ the firstfruits, so he used that word firstfruits again, the promise of many more to come, then it is coming, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come. There has to be this point of transformation. We call it theologically regeneration. When Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he said, you must be born again. So there's a point in time in which we stop being old people and we start being new people and it happens because we've placed our faith in Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. Number four, the sacrifice of Christ. Or excuse me, let me look at Romans 6, 8. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. Dying with Christ doesn't mean that we physically die. It's when I come to faith in Jesus Christ, I died to the old man. And now I'm alive to Jesus Christ. I died to the old man. Not because I chose to die, but in Christ, he put to death the old man and gave me a brand new man. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 and 15, the writer of Hebrews, talking about Jesus, said, He himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and delivered all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. There's nothing that holds us captive more than the fear of death. The fear of death does so many things to motivate us negatively. We're looking for that that aging gene, so we'll live longer. Now, I'm, I'm personally in favor of living long. Um, but if we have this many diseases in 70, 80, 90 years, what in the world is going to happen to us in 200 years? Death is a blessing to the believer because we get to get out of this body of sin. We get to have a new body. Now again, I, I don't think we illegitimately hope for death. I think that's the coward's way out. But we don't fear it either. We should live our lives to the glory of God, not worrying about death. 
because all of our days were written in his book before one of them came to be. Let's stop fretting about death. Not be stupid either. But live a responsible life before a holy God and just leave death up to him. Okay? The scripture has two things to say on death that are very important. The psalm says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. It also says in scripture that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So we need a balanced view of death. For the Christian, sure, we'll miss our family on earth. They'll miss us. We won't miss them because we'll be in the presence of Jesus. They'll miss us. But the death of the wicked, we should not enjoy either. Because God doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked. Our goal as Christians is to present Christ to lost people. Because if somebody didn't share it with me, I wouldn't be born again. And if you're a Christian, somebody shared it with you so that you could receive Jesus Christ by faith and be born again. That's the beauty of the gospel message. It's not, it's not kept private. We spread it out there. We are to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's why we send out missionaries. That's why we evangelize our neighbors. That's why we tell people about the good news of Jesus because we believe it's, it's something everybody needs. Number four. The final deliverance comes through the power of Christ's resurrection. Final deliverance comes through the power of Christ's resurrection. Verse 24, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. This is a cool uh, scriptural truth that we do not have time to extrapolate out. We don't have time to fully discuss it. So I'm just going to give you a couple of points, uh, three points in particular that will help you. I'm, I'm missing one page. No, there it is. Uh, that will help you. Four points in particular that will help you understand this. I'm going to go through them very briefly. Number one, Jesus, the Son of God, will hand over the kingdom to the Father in absolute victory. He's going to hand over the kingdom to his father after he's had absolute victory over it. Jesus doesn't have like a draw in this kingdom fight. He's a hands down winner. Colossians chapter 1 verses 19 and 20. For in him, that is in Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. If you've got your Bibles, look at Colossians chapter 2. Jesus Christ died on the cross to satisfy the Father. In satisfying the Father, he's reconciling people to God. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Jesus Christ doesn't leave his people in their sin. We're still sinners, but our sins are forgiven. He rescues us, he redeems us, and he reconciles us to the Father. And in the end, he's going to present all of those who follow him to the Father. And it's going to be a wonderful day in which he does that. So he's going to hand the kingdom over to the Father in absolute victory. The second thing is that Jesus leads his chosen ones in procession to the Father. It was not uncommon in the day in which Christ lived for a conquering army to return home with its captives marching behind. Now in those days, those captives would have been sad. We're glad Jesus captured us. So what we're doing is we're like ransomed people 
from uh, abusive homes that they've come in and rescued, and we are praising the Lord for being rescued by Jesus as he marches us into the city, and people are throwing flowers, and people are yelling, and people are shouting. That, by the way, is the angels, because there's rejoicing in heaven when one person is converted. There's a rejoicing that goes on in heaven. In 2 Corinthians... Chapter 2, verse 14, Paul writes, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. That's that allusion back to the conquering king riding into town. People are throwing flowers, and as the horses would step on those, and as you would crush them under your feet, the fragrance and the aroma of those flowers would just fill the air. And there's just this wonderful, fresh smell to marching in behind the victorious king. And pictorially, we are that fragrance to God because of Jesus Christ. He's cleansed us and he's redeemed us if we've received Christ as Savior and he leads us and we follow. Number three, Christ's, resur- Christ's current reign will continue until every one of his enemies are defeated by him. He will reign until every one of his enemies are defeated by him. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24 after destroying every rule and every authority, and we could say, and every power. Romans chapter 5, verse 10. For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. It does no good to be saved by an unresurrected Savior. If Jesus couldn't defeat death and the grave still held him, there would be no point in salvation. But the fact that he did rise victoriously gives us hope and we can rejoice in all that God has done. And then we come to the very last one. The very last enemy to be destroyed is death. Those of you who have been here a while, have heard me talk about the already not yet principle in scripture there's this it's already done in Christ but it's not yet completely done and so that's the already not yet principle of scripture already Jesus Christ has conquered death but he's yet to conquer death 1 Corinthians 15 verses 25 and 26 he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So already, Jesus has conquered death by his resurrection. Already, he's conquered death by his resurrection. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. Which now has been manifest through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He's already conquered death, but not yet. Death will be completely defeated at the end of time. So for the Christian, we have this tension. Already we know we're not going to die spiritually. Sure be nice if we could get through that first part, right? And not have to die physically. But the Bible says it's appointed unto man wants to die don't rush it it'll come live to the glory of God he's already defeated death and at the end of time death will be permanently and completely defeated so we just need to live confidently in Christ Revelation chapter 21 verse 4 speaking of the end time He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things 
have passed away. There's going to come a day when no one will ever die again. That's because no one will be reproducing anymore. That's because we'll all be in heaven with Christ. If we've received Christ, we'll be there with him, and death will never enter our thoughts. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 54 to 57. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ rose from the dead, is ascended to the Father, preparing a place for all those who receive him by faith. One commentary made this statement, I'll close with this. Paul's only intent is to show that Christ's res resurrection will culminate in the dethronement of all the malignant powers Faith in Christ's resurrection embraces the conviction that the oppressors will not ultimately triumph over their victims. It is appointed unto man wants to die. That's not the end. There's life beyond the grave. And for all who've received Jesus Christ, that life is a sinless life where we never feel pain, we never are, are persecuted, and we get to be with our Lord and Savior forever and ever and ever. For those of who aren't in Christ, the opposite is true. We're going to focus on the positive, and that is today is the day of salvation. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, today is the day of salvation. And right where you are, by, by faith, you can call out to God, surrender your life to Jesus Christ, and become a child of God. Father, we thank you for the resurrection of our Savior. We thank you for the, the grace of God and the satisfaction that was found in Christ's atoning sacrifice. Father, we're thankful that if we're in Christ, we're new creations. We'll still sin, but the penalty of sin has been paid. We can't and shouldn't go on sinning just so we get more grace, but we ought to strive to be like our Savior who pleased the Father in everything he did. And so, Father, we just want you to know we love you. We're so thankful that Jesus Christ conquered death and gives us hope and a future through his own blood. We praise you in Jesus' name.